Welcome back to EGM 702, Photogrammetry and Advanced Image Analysis. This is week one, part three, Stereophotogrammetry. So in the last lesson, we talked about parallax and how we can use that to, um, how we can use the principle of parallax to estimate or calculate the distance between the observation point and the object that we're observing. And that, in fact, is more or less the basis of stereophotogrammetry. So stereophotogrammetry is where we're using multiple cameras or a single camera that takes multiple photos in order to calculate 3D positions. Historically, uh, this is done using, again, I mentioned in the first lesson, a, something called a stereo plotter or some similar equipment. And the way that this would work is you would put one image here on the left hand side of the uh, of the machine you'd put a second image on the right hand side of the machine and you would look through a viewfinder and it would combine the images in a way that you would actually be able to see the three-dimensional uh, shape of whatever it was in the photographs um, in the modern world uh, we're doing this using computers and specialized software uh, so this example from uh, some of the data that we'll use in the lab or in the practical for next week. Uh, I have a number of camera positions uh, that have been estimated over the Mount St. Helens volcano from some historic air photos. And you can see the three-dimensional shape of the volcano estimated from uh, the points in the images here. So we can use two images. We need at least two images to do stereophotogrammetry. Uh, normally, we want at least three images. We like to have a little bit of redundancy in our calculations. So it makes things a bit easier. So the basic workflow looks like this. Uh, we have planning and acquisition, actually acquiring the images, doing any pre-processing that might be necessary, and then we do something called finding and matching tie points. We compute our camera calibration. We do something called a bundle adjustment, we put in some control points, we do some dense correlation, and we pull out a DVM and maybe do some orthorectification. That's a lot of different steps and we're not going to cover all of them right now. So planning and acquisition is going to be the final part of the lesson of the lectures for this week. Uh, control points is going to be the next lesson, part four. Um, but what we do in practical one uh, is going to be all of these different steps. Um, you'll be able to go through each of these individually um, and see how they work, uh, at least in one software package. Um, and in uh, week three of this course, or of this module, uh, we're going to be talking a little bit more about some of these pre-processing steps that we might do. Uh, so for the rest of this, uh, of this lesson, we're going to talk about most of these steps that are inside of this red rectangle here. So the first step that we will talk about is finding tie points between our images. And these are points that are visible in both or at least two of our images. And you can see that here we have two different images that have some overlapping area. Uh, we have a bunch of points marked by red dots that have been identified by our software as belonging to both images, and we have some outliers that we'll talk about in a little bit. So we can go through and find tie points manually, uh, but this is a very painful, slow process, and I do not recommend it. Um, it takes a lot of effort, uh, as you will see in the practical, to, to go through the images to find the same point in multiple images. Um, so we usually avoid doing this manually. Uh, historically, uh, you would do this with about six different points. This is the, the absolute minimum to be able to uh, solve the equations to, to do the actual photogrammetry. Uh, with modern photogrammetry software, we're usually dealing with, as you can see here, uh, tens, hundreds, maybe even thousands of points. There are a number of different uh, image matching algorithms that you might see in the literature. Um, one of the main ones is what's called SIFT. This, is, this stands for Scale Invariant Feature Transform. Um, another 
one is called surf or speeded up robust features and still another is something called orb which stands for oriented fast and rotated brief and as you might guess from that name fast and brief are two other algorithm names it's sort of a matryoshka doll so we use these different algorithms to find our tie points we use the tie points to help us find the relative exterior orientation so what we're trying to do is we're trying to point the camera in space at least within the relative geometry of the images before we move on to the real world so the way that all of these different algorithms work is that they first identify a number of different potential matches also known as features and these different features are usually described as a vector they do this for both of the images and then taking the potential features from vector one or from image one they usually try to find the closest in quotation marks feature that has been identified in image two so what they're what you're just looking for is something that looks very much or very close to something like the same thing or to a, a point in the other image so as you might guess when we say closest we're not we're not finding exact matches that's kind of a hard problem that we try to avoid having to do um, and so we need to find some way of identifying and removing the false matches or the outliers and usually this is a process or one of the more common process one of the more common ways of, of removing these outliers is something called random sample consensus or RANSAC. So what that looks like is, let's say that we have a number of different points and we're trying to fit at least one straight line to all of these different points. So we have, if we, if we just say take all of these points together, we might get a line that looks like this but that's not really very satisfying, is it? It's not very close to the line, the, the points that you can tell are definitely forming a line. And it also looks like maybe there's another line kind of going almost perpendicular to this line. So what random sample consensus does is it takes a random sample of all of the different features. And then it takes another one, or it, so it takes a random sample, it fits a line, then it takes another random sample and it also fits the line. And then it takes another random sample and it also fits the line. And it keeps going and keeps going until it gets a line that it thinks is pretty much the one that all of the points, or at least most of the points, agree is the correct line. So let's say we take a random sample and we happen to get three points that look like this. We would fit a line. That's one example. Let's say we take four points like this and we fit a line and again we would keep going and in this case we would probably only end up getting the line marked here in cyan because just the number of points uh, is outweighing the the points identified here in purple so we have a way of identifying points between the images we have a way of kicking out outliers we'll move on to our next step, which is fixing the external orientation. So for each camera, we want to find three rotation parameters, often called omega, phi, and kappa. You may also see these referred to as pitch, roll, and yaw. These are our rotations of the camera around the x-axis, the y-axis, and the z-axis. And for each of the cameras, we are finding these rotation parameters, but we're also finding the center of the projection, so the camera's location in space. And this schematic here shows you what each of these parameters correspond to if our camera is located at this little blue dot here. So what we're doing is we're finding the relative orientation first. So what this is is the way that the cameras are oriented um, the rotations, the center of the projection, but it is scaled to the camera geometry. 
we're only using tie points. These are not tied to the real world. And what this looks like is if we have our diagram here, so we have a camera that has taken three different pictures of an object. We see there are different tie points. Uh, so the blue corner or the blue dot here is located in all three of these images, the red dot, the green dot, the yellow dot. So what we're trying to do is to figure out where our three images had to be taken from so that we see each of these points in their respective locations in each of the different images. Um, so this again, this is what is known as the relative orientation. When we want to move to the real world, that is a step called fixing the absolute orientation. Um, we do this using real world control points. So control points that we've actually measured either out in the field or from some other source. We'll talk a bit more about that in the next lesson. Um, and these points, we need to have at least three of them. They need to be non-collinear, which means that they, these three points cannot form a straight line. And they need to be visible in at least two of the images. And again, we'll talk a little bit more about selecting control points in the next lesson. So once we have our images, we have our tie points, we have our either relative or absolute orientation, we want to actually calculate the parallax shifts between the two images and figure out the distance or the 3D topography of the image. So the way that we do this is that for each pixel in our first image, we want to find the corresponding pixel in the second image. And we do this with, this is a step often called dense matching. So we have some problems. So the first problem is, this is going to be computationally expensive. If we start with one pixel in image one, we search through the entirety of image two, that's gonna take a while. If we then repeat that for every single pixel in image one, this is gonna take an extremely long time. So we wanna to try to avoid this. Another reason that this is a problem is that the pixel might not actually be visible. Our images are not looking at the same things. We may not end up seeing one of these pixels in the other image. Another problem, finding, finding features at the pixel scale might be very difficult. We might not be able to see the forest for the trees. So we wanna to try to avoid doing this sort of small scale matching. Uh, we wanna limit our search space. So the way that we might do this and the way that this is done in, in a lot of uh, photogrammetric software is by limiting the search space to what are called epipolar lines. So to show what an epipolar line is, I'm going to show an example here. So we have our first image, image one, uh, with a blue dot here, and what this camera is, or what this camera is seeing. We have our second camera, our second image, and what that image sees. And then we have a line that we can draw connecting these two cameras in space. And we have a, a point P that we can see. And I should also note, it's hard to tell from this diagram, but this, this line intersects this image at some location. So this is, this is actually where this camera can see this camera. Okay. So we also have a line connecting our camera one to point P, and we have the location of point P in our first image. So one thing that we know, we don't actually know how far away point P is. What we do know is that it has to lie somewhere along this line. And so we can start from our camera location number two, and we can look for the, we can, we can search along the projection towards this line from this camera. So we draw a line from here over to the line and we look and if we see the point, then we know that P has to be here, but we don't actually see the point, so we keep going. So we try again, we search here, we still don't see the point and 
we keep going, we keep going, we keep going, and eventually we do find our point P. So you'll notice that all of these different rays going from, uh, going from our second camera over to this line, they all intersect this image at some point. So we have our point two here. They all intersect this image along a line. That line is what is known as an epipolar line. So this is the projection of the line from point one or from camera one to point P in our second camera. And it's along this line that we want to do our searching and do our matching. Once we have calculated our epipolar lines for each, each point, we calculate the correlation score for the pixels along the epipolar line. So the, what, what we're doing here is we're comparing the similarity of the points that we see along the way and we take the best match. And usually that means the highest correlation score, but not always. Um, but I guess in general, we can just say it's the highest correlation score. We usually, rather than doing this pixel by pixel, we usually take a matching template of a certain size. For example, we might be matching uh, windows of five pixels by five pixels, maybe a little bit higher um, but usually about, I think about five pixels by five pixels is pretty common. To sum all of this up, uh, with multiple cameras or multiple images, we can reconstruct 3D positions. Uh, we start by finding the matching points between the different images. We use these matching points, these tie points, to calculate the positions and the orientations of the cameras. If we have control points, we can find the absolute position or the absolute orientation of the cameras, um, but we can also do this scaled to the geometry of the images, something called the relative orientation. Once we have our camera orientations, we can do something called dense matching to help us find the 3D locations of each pixel in the, to find the 3D locations of each pixel in the images, which allows us to get the 3D locations of whatever it is that we're looking at. So I've included some additional resources here. Uh, the first is a paper from uh, Rupnik et al. 2017 that describes the Micmac uh, photogrammetry software that we'll be using in the practical. Uh, another one is from Terry Toutin in 2002 uh, looking at extracting DEMs um, from aster imagery. And then there's also a video here that explains a little bit more about stereo 3D vision. Um, so you can click on this link to see the YouTube video. So that is all for this lesson. I hope you found it interesting. And if you have any questions, please post them in the discussion board on Blackboard. Thanks. Bye.